Good morning. It's good to see everybody again. Get right into the topic of pediatric orthopedic and sports medicine. Uh, of course, this is informal. If you have any questions, uh, just yell them out. Uh, if you have any uh, uh, questions about a specific case, just yell them out. If you want to discuss a specific case, uh, just holler and uh, we'll, we'll go over it. Uh, so today we're going to talk about pediatric orthopedics, uh, and, and the, the slant on this is sports medicine today. Um, get the control right here. The idea behind this particular picture on the title screen here is, is that the 10 years old looks different, right? So uh, when you when you combine a 10 year old, sometimes you get a 10 year old this size, <laughs> sometimes you get one this size. That's some just a thing about in sports, especially contact sports. Uh, although baseball isn't traditionally contact sport, but uh, certainly at the plate, uh, we're running bases. Or even to the collisions in the outfield, uh, there's going to be kids of different sizes uh, and shapes. And so that's something to think about, too. If one child is very small, and I, I don't think this child is particularly small, uh, but this child is particularly big. So I, I think that uh, something to think about is you, you know, if you have children your own or grandchildren that are going to play sports, this is something to consider. Uh, not everybody's a football player. Uh, as my father told us, uh, and I tell my children, so, some objectives for today. We want to just look at some common pediatric disorders uh, and and and, and uh, accompanying sports medicine injuries uh, that the primary care practices are, are definitely going to see uh, and, and are already seeing in their offices. Discuss some pertinent history and physical exam findings um, that may help us aid in that diagnosis for the patient. Draw in some of our differential diagnoses that we encounter uh, with patient musculoskeletal complaints. Uh, and then discuss some patient treatment uh, algorithms uh, for musculoskeletal conditions. Identify those red flags if, if they are there. And, and then is there, a, as a, is there a need to refer, and if so, to who? And uh, probably a lot of this you already know, um, but we're just going to sort of rehash it. Uh, maybe identify some new information. So back pain. So di different take on back pain in children than I do in adults. Uh, I don't groan when I see children with back pain like I do with adults. Um, and I just want to show you a couple of things. 50% of children will have some complaint of back pain by age 15. Up to 36% report an episode, episode of back pain by school age. And if you look at the, the data here, so 85 84% of the patients that presented for back pain had a pathologic diagnosis. It wasn't a strain or sprain. Uh, by 95, it was only 22%, 2014, 34%. So the idea here is that there's more presentations of back pain. And because of that, the number of times it's significant is less, right? So there's a dilution factor there uh, in terms of, uh, it, listen, 84% of the time these kids were presenting with a fracture or a tumor. You know, uh, in these cases, oh, thank goodness, only 22% of the time. It doesn't mean there's less uh, pathologic diagnoses. It just means there are more presentations. The epidemiology here, uh, boys typically present more often than girls. Um, when you see very young children or toddlers present with back pain, Oftentimes, that is organic uh, back pain. They're, they're not, you know, little children don't present with strains and sprains like adolescents do. Um, so that's usually a, a bit of, I, I wouldn't necessarily call that a red flag, but that's a bit of a concern uh, if you see that. Often, uh, adolescents, at least in our practice, they'll have sort of a nondescript, uh, nonspecific type of back pain. Uh, thankfully, in most of those cases, it, it's not pathologic. It is a strain or a sprain, not an overuse injury from a sport or an activity. A good HP though uh, will help you identify maybe who needs further workup. Do we need further imaging? Are there any red flags, or is there a cause for concern? Because you know, as as you know, at least as well as I know, um, when it comes to pediatric patients, there's not just a pediatric patient. There are parents or grandparents involved. There are coaches involved. Um, so there's a lot of other things that are concerned besides just that patient. What are red flags in terms of back pain? And I would tell you in terms of uh, musculoskeletal pain in general in children, uh, is the pain constant? Does it radiate or go anywhere else? 
are there constitutional symptoms? So is this patient having trouble sleeping? Is there a fever? Is there chills? Is there weight loss? Is there pain at night uh, that may be keeping them up and that's why they're not sleeping? Are there abnormal neurologic findings? So are, is there uh, strength issues? Is there gait issues? Is there a gait disturbance? Uh, are there balance issues? Reflex changes, atrophy. So those are the things that do concern us. And, and, and these are, uh, these are uh, red flags. You know, we, I have a, a, one of my sons, uh, Michael. Uh, so Michael's currently not injured. That's pretty much how I describe it. Uh, he's currently not injured. Uh, I can't say what's going to happen this afternoon or anything like that, but uh, Mike, uh, last year, uh, about five days before this meeting, kicked something and had a metatarsal fracture. Um, and then I, I'm like, listen, guys, just be careful. And then two days before we left, Dave fell off the scooter and broke his nose. And so we came down with two fractures, but Dave was ambulatory. Uh, and Mike wasn't, so I had to carry Mike everywhere. Mike's about as big as me. So, uh, you know, so... Mike's currently not injured. Um, and then we went home and then he slipped on the ice crossing the street. So never let your 15 year old cross the street alone. But he <laughs> fell down and he had some deep pain. We couldn't tell if it was a meniscus tear or did he have an osteochondral injury. Um, it ended up being neither of those things, but he did have uh, quad atrophy. Uh, and, and but he was never non weight bearing, so I didn't put him on crutches or anything like that. We didn't immobilize him, but he had drastic quad atrophy compared to the other side. And so, what would probably happen when he fell was he had a femoral nerve stretch and had significant atrophy on, on the affected side compared to his contralateral side. So, with, with kids, you never know, but when you see atrophy, that's something they can't fake, right? It's not like he pretended to have atrophy, <laughs> you know. Uh, he, he could pretend to have pain, he could pretend to have weakness, he could pretend to walk differently, and he wasn't trying to get out of anything. Quite the opposite, he's trying to get back into everything. So whenever you see some of these findings, uh, they're, they're often a cause for concern. So uh, in this, you know, I don't even, <laughs> you know, everybody could do it once, right? <laughs> You could do that one time and probably do nothing ever again. But uh, so th this shows you some degree of, of, of how flexible children are. Uh, gymnastics is a brutal sport. Uh, you know, UFC fighting and, and uh, young adolescent female gymnastics are probably about the same level of trauma. Uh, it, it's crazy. Uh, so is the onset of pain, is it acute? Is it due to trauma? Is there a sprain? strain, is there disc herniation, an apotheosial ring fracture of the spine, uh, or some other type of fracture, not apotheosial. Um, is the onset slower insidious, right? Is it a tumor? Is it getting worse as time goes on? Is it unremitting? Meaning, no matter what the level of activity, there's always pain, and there's pain at night, right? I don't like night pain in, in children or adults. Is it radicular? Is there some nerve root compression that's going along with it? Is it over a wide area? I love when things are necessarily nondescript because maybe it is an overuse injury, strain, sprain, or is it sports related? Does it hurt worse after activity than some ice and towel and it goes away? Uh, these could be evident. This could obviously could be evidence of, of not so serious things like strain or just overuse, or more specific things uh, like spondylosis or spondylolysis, a, a kyphosis, uh, disc herniation. Um, Usually, kyphosis isn't actually an acutely acquired thing either. What aggravates it? What makes it better? We ask that all the time in orthopedics, uh, regardless of the patient's age. So, is it repetitive? You know, it, does the athlete have some sort of repetitive injury? Is it from hyperextension, which you might find um, in gymnastics? Uh, or even your young football linemen, right? So linemen come together, hit each other, trying to stand each other up, right? There's hyperextension involved. Um, and that causes shear forces in the lumbar spine, uh, thoracolumbar spine. Uh, are they dancers? Are they rowers, right? Are they football players or gymnasts? If they're high level performers and it's an overtraining issue, uh, sometimes it's a stress fracture or some sort of overuse injury related to that overtraining. Uh, I don't like resting pain. Again, that's bad. That 
usually imply something else is going on, uh, more serious than an overuse injury or stress fracture. Um, osteoid osteoma, it's just thrown in there as a cause of back pain in those younger patients. Uh, it's not very specific to an age group, a five to 25. It's a type of bone tumor. It is benign. It doesn't metastasize. It doesn't always need surgery. Um, but I, I don't know if you've had any patients with that. It, to me, at least in my practice, it's extremely rare. Uh, but it's something you can find on, uh, on x-ray. It favors the long bones and the spine, uh, particularly the thoracolumbar spine. It's the type of pain, it's sort of a dull ache, but gets better with NSAIDs, right? That's one of the classic findings of osteoidosteoma. It gets better with, with, it, with, uh, with NSAIDs. Usually, you, when you do find a tumor, it's usually less than, than two centimeters or less than an inch, okay? Again, it doesn't get bigger, it doesn't metastasize. Um, you know, you can treat it solely with NSAIDs. You know, within two to three years, it, it probably resolves, um, but, but it's there. It, it, there's other ways to treat it, some are surgical. Um, but that's something in your differential in osteoidosteoma. Again, something easy to find on x-ray, uh, obviously easy to find on CT scan or MRI, but it should be, should be in, your, in your differential diagnosis in, in young people. So physical exam findings. So some things uh, can, be, can be obvious, right? So, and I, 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 Dr. Crow's not here. So I looked this picture up trying to figure out what she was trying to tell us with this picture. Um, and this is a three-year-old uh, Taiwanese girl. But the, 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 the point of this, of this uh, picture and this MRI is that sometimes things on the skin, right, can point to something deeper in the spine that we can't see, right? So this would fall under spinal dysrhythmism, meaning things that we're seeing on the skin that may indicate something deeper going on. And, you know, capillary lace spots, dimpling, uh, skin appendages, or you know, skin tags, skin lesions, and certainly this is abnormal growth of hair. Um, and in this case, we have, a, if you will, a splitting of the cord, and, and there's a little cyst there. Okay, uh, a syrinx, we would call it, a sphingomalia. And 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 really, you wouldn't see all this by looking at the skin, but you would see this, and this would tell you something else is going on. Uh, stork test, right? So in this patient, uh, there's lumbar hyperextension while standing on one leg, and that may exacerbate pain that's related to like a pars defect or a pars lesion or a spondylolysis, which is a type of fracture. A Faber's test or Patrick's test uh, might be indicative of SI pain. Straight leg raise test, you know, or, or the sitting uh, test that we had on, on the previous lecture, might be uh, indicative of radicular pain to the knee or lower lower leg from a hernia nucleus pulpus or a hernia disc or hamstring tightness. A good neurologic exam is important and, and try to note the patient's gait. Uh, I think gait in children is very helpful. Yeah, there's uh, a differential diagnosis because not everything is orthopedics as much as we'd like it to be. Uh, there are other problems uh, like UTI, hydronephrosis, ovarian cysts, testicular ovarian torsions, IBD, uh, pneumonia with some chest wall pain. All these things can cause referred pain uh, to the back as well. And we want to, you know, we're, uh, I, I try to remember, I'm, I'm not just an orthopedic surgeon, I'm supposed to be a doctor too. And these are things we need to think about. <laughs> How about lab tests? Are you going to get a lot of lab tests? So I, I tend to not order anything I can interpret, right? So that's rule number one. And I don't prescribe medicines I can't pronounce. So those are my two rules of thumb for medicine. So in children, if they're very young, again, the cause is likely more organic uh, than overuse in young children and toddlers. Nighttime pain or constitutional symptoms, that may, that may prompt me to order some laboratory testing. What do I order? Maybe a CMC with death, a SED or a CRP. Is this an inflammatory issue? Is this an infectious issue? I wanna know about those kind of things and I wanna interpret them. I don't get too far off my area of expertise though. I'm not a pediatrician, and I'm not a pediatric or a big surgeon, although we do take care of pediatric patients. There's a very, very big difference in, in terms of what a pediatrician knows and what I know about children. So your analysis, if I'm thinking this could be uh, a urinary tract infection, hydronephrosis, uh, something like that. Rheumatologic diseases, HLA-B27, 
Mutant factors, A and A, line titers, line titers. You know, at least in Erie, uh, Erie County, where, where, where I work, um, I usually get two or three of these a year that are positive. I have an elderly patient with some knee pain and recurrent swelling. I'm taking care of now. Just got his results before we left. They're positive. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, have an approach to how you handle some of these things in terms of, uh, like Lyme disease, for example. You know, if I can't really figure it out, um, what's going on? Hey, listen, this isn't arthritis necessarily. Uh, this isn't a meniscus tear. There's no history of trauma, but I have a recurrent uh, fusion. Fluid looks pretty good when I pull it out. And there are some details about that. Fluids are important. They're outside the, the, this part of the talk. But uh, uh, so have a way of handling or, or have a suspicion about these things. Um, if, if, if your physical exam and your history aren't, aren't really filling the gaps for you. Okay, so spondylolysis, so lysis, a break or space, right? And what, what we're trying to point out here is, is that pars defect. Um, everybody remembers the Scotty dog, right? Scotty dog sign. And I think that's best seen in, in the oblique films uh, when you do the lumbar spine. Um, but essentially, here, here's that Scotty dog right here. Right, there's the ears, there's the head. And then it's a scotty dog and has a collar. That's a break in the part right there. And you can see, uh, obviously, CT scan is even better for that. You can see bilateral part defects there. And then even in this, this simple lateral view, uh, we can see that. Okay. And it is a defect or stress fracture of the parts. Now, what about if you have an injury and you don't see it, right? So suspicion is maybe what prompts that next test. The MRI, for example, you're going to see edema, bony edema, or some level of activity at, at that at that area uh, without a fracture, a clear cut fracture like we see on CT or uh, plain radiographs. So MRI can be helpful in those cases. Repetitive microtrauma hyperextension. Again, your linebacker, um, your gymnast, uh, divers, dancers. I don't see a ton of those in the practice, but gymnastics and football we definitely see. Eighty percent of the time, it's bilateral. Right? They may have a history of low back pain. Sometimes it radiates to the buttocks or legs. Okay, The pain is usually worse with activity. I think that's pretty, pretty classic. Postural changes. So they have a flat lumbar spine. They don't have that nice lordotic curve. Do they have some hamstring tightness? Do they have a, a bit of a shuffling or a stiff gait? Right? Um, so and these are more subtle changes, I think, especially if you're seeing them for the first time and it's not like you know how they walk normally. Um, so I, I think these are more subtle, uh, but I think this helps you at least go down that road of suspicion for spondylolysis. So how do you treat those patients? Well, obviously, you're going to modify their activity. They're not going to be the linebacker that day. They're not going to do states for gymnastics. Um, they're going to take a little break. Um, we're going to do hamstring stretches and sets. Uh, uh, this is a TLSO brace, the rack of lumbar uh, support. So, um, and then stabilization, if conservative measures fail, you know, that, that's a big step. 15% uh, of these patients will progress to spondylolisthesis, which is that slippage of vertebrae. So one sliding forward on another. And we'll talk about that as well and show you an x ray. All right, so spondylolisthesis, that or slippage or subluxation, whatever you prefer, uh, of one segment, in this case, the L5 on S1. Uh, and and as you, if you can imagine that back here is the spinal cord, right? And there's an opening for a spinal cord. And as one slips on the other, that opening is getting smaller, right? And you're stretching that cord. You're pulling on those nerve roots. Uh, we, we sort of grade these. Uh, if we divide this lower piece here, S1, into fourths, right? So it's a grade one if it's zero to uh, 25%, grade two on up to a great four, which would be almost a complete slip there. Um, you may feel the step off if the spinous processes are, are very separated. I, I don't know that I've ever said, oh yeah, oh, this is a grade one, grade two. It would have to be like a four for me to feel. And then um, uh, the treatment is the same. Uh, if the slip is less than 50%, if it's more than 50%, now you have to start to think about stabilizing. And that would be with hardware. Of some kind. Let's move on to the hips. So slip capital femoral epiphyses or skiffies as we like to call them. Um, very specific 
a diagnosis for a very specific age group and type of patient. Um, so what happens is there's displacement of the femoral neck from the capital femoral epiphyses. So this is the capital femoral epiphyses right here. This is the growth plate. Here's the neck, okay? And, and essentially, uh, we always like to think that this is in the right place and the rest of the leg is slipped somewhere else, right? We always name things distal in orthopedics. So, uh, you know, dislocations, fractures, we always describe the distal part of it and not the proximal part of it. Um, so if you look at this particular picture, and, and these lines are, are called Klein's lines, okay? And essentially you draw a line along the uh, femoral neck, right? And it should intersect a piece of the epiphysis or what will be the femoral head later. And it does here and it does not here, okay? So essentially uh, this epiphysis, this proximal piece of the femoral head has moved has slipped down, and that's why this line is not intersecting any of it, okay? Um, it has a male predilection, it has a mean age, and, and, and usually this is when people are growing, right? So F12 in females, F13 in men, uh, they're growing a lot, that, so that's not a risk factor, but a reason. 50% uh, of those, uh, or 50 percent of the affected people are above the 90th, 90th percentile for weight, so it's bigger kids. So if I could pick one risk factor for this happening in that age group, it's obesity, right? Uh, and, and that's what we have as the bullet box. Uh, and that would be a test question. So if it was an ortho board or even a primary uh, uh, family medicine board, uh, that, that's, always a, that, that's always a question. So if we look at our ortho bullets for the residents when they review test questions, that's always a question. 20% uh, of those patients, up to 25%, are bilateral on presentation. What makes this difficult to diagnose is the fact that there are chronic symptoms and there are acute symptoms. There are stable patients and there are unstable patients, right? So your stable patients are the ones that may or may not have some pain, right? No big displacement, and they can weight bear with or without crutches. The unstable patients cannot weight bear even with crutches, all right? So that's a problem. So you wanna make sure that if you, you know they're unstable, they can't walk on it, and there may not be any history of trauma, by the way. It, it's not necessarily a fall that causes this. You wanna make sure that those kids get referred because they're gonna need something done, probably a pinning of some kind uh, to stabilize that, uh, that slip. And because if it goes on to be a problem uh, later, like this one's a problem, you know, a, a good, Less than 10% of these kids, when they're stable, if they're treated, are going to go on to something called avascular necrosis. Greater than 47% or up to 47% are going to go on to avascular necrosis if they're unstable. So you want to make sure that you get them while they're stable and get them taken care of. Um, trying to think of anything else you need to know about that. There are some uh, ethnic, ethnic uh, findings when you look at these two. So uh, you look at Caucasian uh, patients, you look at African-American patients, um, Hispanic patients, uh, you, probably a higher uh, uh, evidence of uh, predilection for African-American children, Hispanic children, um, Pacific Islanders, all right, uh, more, more so than Caucasian children. They're usually a big kid, though. And the other thing is endocrine factors. Uh, a lot of these kids are going to have hypothyroidism, growth hormone abnormalities, and hypopituitarism, uh, and hypo hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the hypothyroidism is more common in the Down syndrome patients. They have an increased risk of Skippy. Uh, who gets a workup for endocrine disorders, though? So if the child is less than 10, right? Or more than 15. If their height is less than 10 to 50th percentile, so growth hormone, uh, those are the ones you're going to probably want to work up uh, for endocrine disorders. Renal osteodystrophy, six to eight fold increase in risk. Oftentimes they are bilateral and simultaneous in those children. And then secondary hyperparathyroidism. Genetic prevalence, often, I don't say oftentimes, but maybe a little more than 7%. I've seen 
uh, have an affected family member as well. Autosomal dominant uh, is it, always a test question for the residents as well. But um, so that there, there is a particular uh, type of patient that, that's can, you know, uh, that you'll see with this problem. Um, clinically, again, stable, they can bear weight with or without crutches. Unstable cannot. If they're unstable, they have a very high risk of ABM. Okay. Usually uh, they'll present a certain way, right? So there's unstable acute or unstable acute on chronic, meaning you know they have the disease, but there's an acute change to that disease state that causes them to be unstable. Uh, it's usually severe, it's usually pre pretty sudden. Um, the acute patients are those that have been symptomatic for less than three weeks. They could have a shortened leg because of the position of these purposes. They're externally rotated. They have pain with passive range of motion, although they're probably pretty comfortable crossing that affected leg over the unaffected side. They tend to want to keep it flexed and externally rotated. Um, the other thing that I, I want to, yeah, the other thing I want to tell you about is uh, they'll, they'll present with groin pain. They'll present with thigh pain. For up to 50% will present with knee pain. Right, so you may miss the diagnosis completely because you're X-raying the knee and you're like, it looks pretty good to me. I don't know why you're having problems, but but I think that's uh, sort of a I don't want to say a classic mistake, but you can be misguided uh, getting those knee X-rays and focusing on the knee in these patients when clearly the problem with the hip. But uh, through intervention, um, operator intervention, uh, they'll have knee complaints. Okay, so chronic patients, 80 to 90 percent have intermittent pain for greater than three weeks. And, and uh, there are studies out there, uh, and those studies are included in some of these review questions, uh, where 88 percent of these unstable patients had about six weeks of symptoms before presenting as unstable. Right, so if the kid complains about it, it's probably something to think about. Um, they're not complaining to you though until they have real pain and they come to the office, right? But mom and dad are hearing these complaints. So if you have kids and they're in that age group, um, think about it. Uh, again, the legs usually external rotated, hip uh, abduction and external rotation, right? So like I said, they'll have no trouble crossing that leg over the affected side, over the unaffected side. But look at the external rotation in these patients. Pretty obvious. If they are 85 years old, we say they had a hip fracture, right? So a good referral, you know, uh, rather doesn't have to be emergent, but urgent referral. Uh, if they're unstable, then it is emergent. And refer to the emergency department, at least the, an ER that, that has a uh, orthopedic department. Okay, so sports injuries by age. And you can see here, and all we want to show is definitely the distribution changes with age, right? So in these adolescents, the 13 to 17 year old, the predilection is for these type of injuries in the five to 12 year old, the predilection is a little bit different. And by gender, right? So uh, ACLs are about the same. And, and actually, as, as you see, an increase in, in, in uh, women's sports, uh, certainly uh, not just with Title IX, but, but even in grade school and high school, you see uh, more, more ACL injuries, meniscal tears. Again, they're playing the same sports. Why wouldn't they have the same injuries? Uh, fractures. Um, a little bit higher than men, they tend to make poor decisions. And then uh, spondylolysis, patellar femoral pain uh, syndrome, higher in women, that's a structural issue. Uh, apophysitis, instability, pain in general. Let's look at another joint, shoulder dislocation. So 40% of these dislocations occur in, in people less than 22 years of age. The problem with that is, when patients are young, the recurrence rate is very high. It's very high. Even with initial conservative management, the rate is very high. And a lot of these patients do go on to uh, stabilization type surgeries arthroscopically um, because they just keep coming out. And the more they come out, the easier it is every time. So a lot of these patients go on to surgery. Um, but I will tell you, if, you, if I see somebody um, below 22, you can almost bet it's coming out again. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. They could come out lifting the hood of their car. It doesn't have to be another fall or a trauma. Uh, military recruits um, are, are, the, are the best subjects for study because they don't get a choice, right? So they get MRI, then they get surgery. Um, that's how some of this information comes, comes to be. 
All right, Little League Shoulder. So uh, some of the kids that you're seeing here, I'll, I'll tell you, because uh, Mary made these slides up, are her kids. And, and it's not that she's a terrible parent uh, and she's letting the kids pitch 100 pitches a day. She's not, she's very careful about this. Uh, and, and her husband is extremely careful about this stuff. So this just happens to be one of the little crows pitching. And Little League Shoulder is interesting because it occurs near road plate, okay? And it's called uh, epiphyseal lysis. And you can see that there's some bone missing here, right? And that's lysis. Words with throwing their overhead activities, <laughs> usually following an increase in pitching regimen, meaning they're either throwing more pitches or too many pitches uh, for their age. And there's a pitch count for different ages. Uh, if, if, if anybody here is a baseball coach or has kids in baseball, uh, they know what I'm talking about. Um, excessive throwing, poor technique, muscle imbalance, but usually the excessive throwing is the problem. They have swelling or tenderness over this specific area, right here at the shoulder. They may have weakness with resisted abduction and internal rotation of the shoulder. And they may have an external rotation contracture, meaning that they don't have good internal rotation to begin with. So that's something that and that's obviously an x-ray finding, but this is what's going to make you suspicious. Are they a thrower? Are they a pitcher? Do they play baseball? Uh, is the tenderness where it should be? And does a physical exam reveal any of this weakness? And this is what probably would prompt the x-ray. How do you manage these patients? Well, most of the time they're not managed surgically. They're managed with some rest. We modify the activity, i.e. no, no throwing. As the program progresses and their pain decreases, we start some light tossing and gradually you increase the distance that they're throwing and the velocity. Approximately 91% of the time, which is not very approximate, but 90% of the time, if it's successful, they can go on and continue the sport. Um, what are the complications though? Anytime you're working near a physis, you want to make sure that that physis doesn't close early, right? Because 80% of the upper extremity length happens at that growth plate, right? So you don't want one arm that's this big, and then the other arm that's this big. That's a problem, right? So we want to make sure that it doesn't close prematurely. And we want to make sure that that lysis doesn't progress to an actual fracture of the proximal humerus as well. So again, uh, Dr. Crow's son, uh, pitching a baseball. And little leaguer's elbow. So we're going to move down the arm a little bit. Um, 50 to 75% of baseball players in that adolescent age group are going to report some sort of elbow pain. It's not always little leaguer's elbow, uh, but a lot of times it is from, from overuse. So medial epicondyl avulsion fracture, medial epicondyl apophysitis, accelerated apophysy of growth with delayed physio closure, all, all terms that you may hear along with little leaguer's elbow. So it's repetitive contracture of that flexor pronator mass um, against the uh, hypothesis, so it stresses the hypothesis. Right, just an x-ray here. And, and this x-ray probably uh, collects all the findings of radiologic uh, abnormality. So it, it's irregular, right? Um, it is a little bit larger. It does appear separated from the rest of the bone. There's a big space here. And sometimes that's tough to tell without a comparison. Either you look at 10,000 of these and you know it's different, or you get a comparison to the other side and you see it's different. Um, and then fragmentation, there is some fragmentation there as well. So usually less than 10 years old, they could have some medial swelling, right? Uh, and they, they could, their decreased throwing effectiveness or distance. Um, you know, say, hey, hey, you know, Two months ago, you were throwing pretty good. Now you can barely get it to the plate. You know, what's going on? And so that may be one of the clues that there's a problem. Um, again, medial elbow swelling on physical exam, tenderness with palpation, and tenderness with resistant flexion or flexion contracture. How do you treat them? Two to four weeks of rest and sends, stretching and strengthening. So I think, you know, PT is important in some of these patients too. Um, the hardest thing is, is getting them to rest and not throw. I, I think that's the hardest thing in the world. In uh, a throwing program that's at least six weeks long, when symptoms abate. So they have to be asymptomatic to start that throwing program. If they're not, then you're not going to do well, and the symptoms are going to recur or persist for a longer period of time. 
but they usually do very well with this. Uh, let's go down to the knee. So some different types of things we find in the knee, then this whole thing should up. Patel femoral instability, ACL tears, osteochondritis, osteochondritis, slaughter's disease, which is pretty common, and Cindy Larson Johansson. So patel femoral instability, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a dislocation. Um, it can be subluxation. Definitely a higher female male ratio, usually a non contact problem. It's not like somebody collided with them and they smash knees together, although that certainly can happen across a soccer or basketball. So the quadriceps pulls in this direction. The patellar tendon vector is in that direction as well. So it's going to want to have a net vector for pull the patella laterally, at least tilt it in that direction. Now, in female patients, the Q angle is higher, okay? There's a little more valgus, and, and that's why they're a little more apt to have this problem. Okay, another crow child, and uh, the legs are normal. You know, they're pretty normal, uh, just that some kids can do this, others can't. Um, has to do with all of these things in the middle. Different Q angle, increased tibial valgus, excessive tibial torsion, external torsion, Paramal contour dysplasia, patel alto, ligamentous laxity, uh, disruption of the MTFL, uh, which is usually post traumatic, trochlear dysplasia, tight lateral tissue. So there's a lot of things that can lead to the problem. This isn't the problem, it just shows how flexible she is. Uh, and then when you look at this MRI finding, you see that does that patel line up with that trochlea? Not perfectly, not perfectly. There's fluid in here. And if this is post traumatic, that's probably blood probably blood. And you can see uh, this arrow is, is trying to point to the uh, MPFL uh, and maybe a disruption or an avulsion of that as well. So that looks like a post-traumatic uh, MRI. How do you evaluate these patients? Well, si simple test. You know, we, we, you hear, I'm sure you've heard about the J sign, right? So the patella wants to go laterally, but here's the thing. It goes laterally in extension. Right? So as you extend the knee, it stays in the trochlea until it gets to the top of the trochlea and goes laterally. Inflection is just the opposite. It starts in lateral position, and as it engages the trochlea, it centers itself. So you really have to look at it depending on whether you're doing flex or extension at that moment. When you get x-rays, you look for a genuvalgum, right? So a valgus or a knock knee position of the leg, and patella alta, which is something you're going to look for in the lateral pupil. So how high is the patella relative to some other things which are outside the essentially scope of this lecture? But in the lateral view, you'll be able to tell that there's a ratio of the patellar height to the, to the length of the patellar tendon, for example. Um, you can get skyline or merchant views, sunrise views, right? To look at the congruence of the patella, which is terrific in this picture, looks like it lines up perfectly as opposed to this picture. And I'll tell you, there's a couple other things about this picture that are different. Not only does this overhang a little bit, right? But the size of the facets, we'll call the morphology of the facets is different. This is primarily a, a patella with a lateral facet, and hardly any medial, where this one had a little bit more medial. And look at the trochlea here on the medial side, right? Not very big at all compared to, to this one. So there are some uh, subtle findings there. CT and MRI down the road, especially for pre-op planning, can be more helpful. But I don't think you have to get them right away. How do you treat these patients? <clears throat> now, if it's a, a, a uh, traumatic subluxation, traumatic dislocation, then some level of immobilization might be in order, followed by BMO strengthening, right? That vastus medialis strengthening, you have to pull, help center and pull that patella over a little bit, core strengthening. And, and some sort of stabilizing orthosis that may not be permanent, but may be helpful in sports where they're going to have some flexion uh, uh, during the, during the uh, sport itself. Surgical management, if all these things fail, there are some things you can do. You can release the lateral soft tissue structures along the uh, patella, MPFL repair, which makes sense, perfect sense, or reconstruction, um, or taking that tibia tubercle on the tibia and moving it somewhere else too to help with, with tracking. Recurrent patellar subluxation, 
you know, try uh, try a significant amount of conservative care. Um, I usually don't send people for psychologic evaluation, um, but there may be a little bit of that uh, pathology going on in some of these patients as well. Uh, but I would exhaust conservative measures in these patients in particular before I, I thought about surgery. Uh, ACL injuries, you know, um, I'm telling you, everybody knows somebody who's had ACL tear, whether it's a, an adult or an adolescent. Uh, usually non contact, uh, believe it or not. Um, there's an increase in incidence of females as, as sports take off. They're not playing, it's not like the female athletes are playing. Uh, you know, less rough than their male counterparts. They're just as rough, if not worse. Uh, and they're playing the same sport, so you're going to see uh, ACL tears in those patients. Um, a traumatic knee effusion can help with that uh, clinical suspicion. You know, what I mean by that is they, they get injured, and within an hour or so, the knee is swollen, right? They didn't make fluid in an hour, but they can bleed a lot in an hour, and that's where that fluid comes from. Um, but you still want to get that uh, a good Lachman's test, which you try to do early uh, before they get too swollen, um, or uh, certainly an MRI to confirm that diagnosis. Because sometimes it's a partial tear, sometimes it's a complete tear. Risk factors: so female participation in sport, male participation in basketball, and female participation in soccer. A valgus moment of the knee: so the knee, the ankle is going away from the midline, right, and the hip. Adductor moment is towards the midline that's causing a valgus stress on the knee, a previous concussion. So, what do they present? I felt a pop, right? So, this knee is swollen compared to this knee. It's obvious, right? Supertalar pouch. You don't see uh, a well defined uh, patellar tendon. You don't see a well defined patella, right? You just see a sort of a blob. Uh, the pain is deep within the knee. A lot of these patients cannot wait bare right after the injury. Right, you have immediate swelling. We call it hemarthrosis because it's blood. Non op management doesn't have really good outcomes because of all of these things in the second bullet. These will occur right, because the knee's unstable. Surgical indications complete tear or failed non op or partial tear. Probably these partial tears are under red in my experience. Surgery is usually delayed for a little while unless you're in the NFL, right? Because you get your MRI at the stadium. Uh, but most of us don't get our MRI at the stadium. And so we want to make sure that the swellings come down a little bit and we've regained some of their pre-injury range of motion, you know, to help out with the post-op uh, post rehab when their, when their surgery is completed. Return to play. I would say uh, no sooner than nine months. Some people push it to six months. Um, there are some functional tests that we want to replicate. They're sport specific to that patient to make sure they can go back. There are higher rates of re rupture when patients don't follow those instructions to go back early. And you worry about injury to the contralateral side too, right? So while this knee's been laid up for six months or nine months, it's not like the other leg's been out jogging, right? It's on the same, same owner. So it's getting it's decompensating as well. So, uh, and then you want to make sure that you're looking at injury prevention. So you don't get it, a, a, a contralateral injury or a re-injury of the site you just fixed. Um, in female athletes, maybe uh, a little bit more attention for neuromuscular training, plyometrics, like jump training. Meaning when they land, if you if you watch some of the female athletes land from like a box jump down to the ground, they're landing with, with a valgus knee, right? Valgus knee, right? Which is a setup for a knee injury like this. Uh, and you want to land with less valgus and more knee flexion. And so the quads are doing a little more work here. And you want to increase hamstring strength and decrease that dominance ratio. A lot of times the, the quads are stronger than the hamstrings, which can cause hamstring injuries as well. But you want to make sure that you're training them both and, and you're getting as close to equal as you can get for strength. So osteochondritis, desic hands. <clears throat> so these injuries occur. Uh, in patients, uh, and sometimes it's trauma. Is it ischemia? Is it hereditary? Uh, we've had one of these in one of the kids, and our kids as well. Um, usually, some vague pain. Uh, a lot of times, it will present with a little bit of an effusion, not like an ACL effusion necessarily, unless the fragment is really big. And, and oftentimes, there is some trauma associated with that. Um, most common location is this 
lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. This is medial femoral condyle. This is lateral over here, so right in this area. Uh, if it's not displaced, it's relatively uncomplicated, and they have open growth plates or open physis, most will heal without a problem. But there does have to be a period of, of some non bearing associated with that. You just can't have to go back out and run and jump on that problem because it's going to get worse. Um, large defects location on the lateral condyle um, or close physis, some of those patients, the, the problem may, it may heal to some degree, um, but the changes don't necessarily get better. They do lead to osteoarthritic changes. So non-specific knee pain may be activity related. Tenderness over the involved joint line. I think that's a pretty good finding as well. We have an MRI, a, a sagittal view. You can see that here's a femoral condyle, right? And you can see that this piece is separate, right? We actually even have some fluid between the piece and the rest of the femoral condyle. So that, that's easy to see. It's a little bit more subtle many times on x-ray, um, but you can see it on x-ray. And look at those laterals, look at them very carefully. Um, but I think the MRI is helpful uh, in defining location, just like the CP, and determining some level of stability. And there's no radiation involved in the MRI as well. All right, just some arthroscopic views of these. So this is where it came from. Obviously, that's humongous. And then here again, you can see the depth. When we call something osteochondral, what we're inferring is that not only is the cartilage involved, but so is the bone. Many times that fragment has bone on it. And, and if need be, these can be uh, pinned in place or fixed, uh, oftentimes with uh, absorbable hardware, meaning hardware that's going to uh, dissolve or go away after time. It doesn't have to be metal. And then, uh, so conservative care again, six to 10 weeks. Uh, bracing, it, it helps with the mobilization a little bit in some patients. And then no sports for about six months. So it's almost like an ACL injury in terms of what you have to stop them from doing. It's, it's a big deal, though, if you don't treat it well early. All right, so arthroscopy and fixation, if non-op care is failing or has failed, or there's some signs that that piece is not stable and, and may displace. Logic of slaughters, you know, this isn't uh, the worst thing in the world. Uh, it's attraction hypothesis, right? So where your patellar tendon attaches to the proximal hypothesis of the tibia. Common in 10 to 15. I can confirm 14 to 15 in our own family. That's big life. And then uh, it has acute chronic phases. X-rays may show some fragmentation, which is what they're trying to show here. Um, they re, usually everything resolves with skeletal maturity. So when they're done growing, there's no apophysis there anymore. They don't get that pain. So I'm anxiously awaiting uh, skeletal maturity in my goal. So um, untreated, sometimes you can get uh, an early closure of the tubercle. A lot of times though, to get severe genu recurve bottom, which is like hyperextension, if you will, the, knee, the anterior part of that physis will fuse uh, earlier than the posterior. And that's how that happens. When they're symptomatic, you want to avoid jumping the exercises by running. You want to uh, shut them down a little bit. NSAIDs are fine. And therapy, uh, physical therapy is, is helpful. Uh, uh, and I, I guess that's what having children has taught me uh, as an orthopedic surgeon is don't underestimate physical therapy even in, in kids, uh, which I did until I had them. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, we, we've no significant improvement in any of the children with their injuries with some physical therapy. Uh, and then some continued exercise after that as well. I, I think we sort of write, oh, they're going to heal, they'll be fine. Um, but I don't go home with them after the x-rays heal. The parents do. So as a parent and not a big surgeon, uh, I, I, there, is a, there is a value to uh, physical therapy, whether it's this whether it's Seaver's disease of the, of the calcaneus, whether it's a distal radius fracture in a 10 or 12 year old, it matters. Okay, so finally, ascending Larson and Johansson. And you can see there's a little sleeve here that's been pulled off on the inferior patella. Uh, typically it's 10 to 12 years old in, in that age group, but uh, it's, it's a little bit more common. to traction injury, usually overuse, not initially one traumatic event. Um, and it's fragmentation at the fear pole where the patellar tendon attaches there. 
uh, or within the door tent. Um, again, treatment is symptomatic, shutting those kids down, no jumping, no running. Typically, that will resolve or improve without any kind of surgical care. Any questions about any of those topics? Any patients, any children under your own or grandchildren? They're going to have that right now. Matt, is there anybody in line with the question? I, I... Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you.